You're watching New Central Now on New Central Television. I am Nikon Onobanjo. The top stories at this hour. Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima addresses UN General Assembly calls for action against climate change. Central Bank of Nigeria raises interest rates to 27.25%, fifth in 2024. Mali Junta Chief Asimi Goita reviews strategy after terror attack. Details to come your way shortly. The news at the hour begins with updates on the 79th United Nations General Assembly in New York, United States. Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima addressed the United Nations General Assembly, calling for concerted efforts by world leaders to support peacekeeping operations. Shatima, who is representing President Bola Tinumbu, also called for the expansion of the Security Council, calling for a permanent seat for Africa at the United Nations. The vice president also stated that insecurity is driving people into hardship. On climate change, Shatima called for global efforts to mitigate climate change. We cannot deal durable societies with the threats of terrorism, banditry, and insurgency growing in our countries and regions. Indeed, violent extremism remains an existential threat to both national and international peace, security, and development. We are making concerted efforts to contain and roll back this threat. The high-level African counter-terrorism meeting hosted by Nigeria in April 2024 and its outcome, the Abuja Declaration, promises to provide solutions to the challenges presented by terrorists and insurgents. Climate change is a driver of insecurity, which also poses a veritable challenge to sustainable development. A few weeks ago, Large areas of my country were inundated by seasonal floodwaters, including one of our largest cities, Maiduguri, in the northeast. Other parts of Nigeria also experienced similar tragedies, occasioning the loss of lives and property. We need not remind ourselves to remain faithful to the implementation of the commitments that we all gave voluntarily at the various COP meetings. Pale are to do so is merely to postpone the inevitable. No country is immune from the effects of climate change. It is better that we cooperate and collaborate to meet this ever-increasing challenge rather than remaining in our shells, waiting for the inevitable to happen. A common challenge requires a common solution. A couple of minutes ago, we brought you live feeds of President of Nigeria, Kashim Shatima, addressing participants and the assembly that is uh, the United Nations General Assembly, the 79th session uh, ongoing in New York, United States. And it talked about uh, several initiatives of the current administration of President Bolat Numbu in actually dealing with the uh, perennial issues, uh, the socio-economic challenges affecting the country, using the opportunity to call for global concerted efforts to deal with the issues around climate change and addressing the bottlenecks around the SDG goals with a need to ameliorate the plights of the people on the African continent and the global community while also bringing about um, solutions uh, to the socioeconomic uh, challenges also um, affecting people um, in other regions. And now we have um, our correspondent, Bernard Akede, who has been on this uh, particular session, um, the ONGA, that 79th uh, session in the United States, and he will be giving us the updates or uh, basically taking his reaction as regards the address by the Vice President of Nigeria. Uh, Bernard, uh, it's a pleasure having you around. Um, I'd like to get details from you on how you feel or what the body language in response um, to the address given by uh, Kashim Shatima, the Vice President of Nigeria. All right, thank you for having me, Lincoln. Um, to be honest, well, the body language is expected, if you ask me. 
um, what the Vice President Kashim Shetima has said is nothing far from what I expected him to say. He highlighted some of the issues, most of the issues that Nigeria has been experiencing in the past few years. Um, he talked about uh, climate change, talked about global warming, um, he talked about AI, you know, the, the scares and the fears that people are having with the artificial intelligence. Um, he talked about the flooding that we recently experienced in uh, Meduguri. Uh, he talked about the insecurity in the Sahel and how it's affected Nigeria. But after talking about, you know, besides talking about all the ills that the country is facing, he also talked about, you know, the advantages that the country, like a country like Nigeria, can bring to the table. Um, joining other African leaders who spoke today, saying that it is time for African countries and developing countries to have a seat, um, you know, a permanent seat at the United uh, Nations Security Council. Um, you know, he, he basically explained that uh, uh, Nigeria is big enough. Nigeria has the economy now. Nigeria is the, is the go-to country. And not just Nigeria, Africa is the go-to continent. He mentioned the population age of uh, the African continent and how the youthful population of the continent can be an advantage, um, not just to Africans, but to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, they, say, they used to say space is a new frontier. Now it is Africa. Every investor, everybody is coming down this way. And these are some of the things that uh, the Vice President, His Excellency Kashim Shetima, did highlight. Interestingly, I would like to note, that on his way out, after giving that, uh, you know, that long and interesting speech, we were able to catch up with him, and, and he obliged just, just one question very quickly. Um, I asked him um, that almost every African leader who has spoken today has clamored for Africa or African countries to get a seat, uh, you know, a permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council. And I asked him, I said, do you think now is the time? Everybody has asked for it. Do you think now is the time and why? And he said, yes. Now is the time, he answered that question with just three points. He said, now is the time because we have the numbers, we have the economy, and we have the future. Africa is the future. That's all he said. Well, I missed the clamor for a permanent seat uh, in the Security Council of the UN. Um, there are still issues uh, affecting the country. Uh, we're talking about poverty, unemployment rates uh, that are still on the high side, and insecurity. And I'm wondering in his address if he actually sounded convincing uh, to the Assembly uh, while he spoke to them demanding for this. I don't know what your take is. Well, my take on this is, um, yes, he did mention all these things. He mentioned insecurity, he mentioned uh, um, you know, poverty, he mentioned issues with the economy. And remember that he also did say that um, you know, it's expected that the international community should still rally around to support African countries um, that are lagging behind in these particular places. Um, to me, in the early hours of today, when I had conversations um, with Felicity and other uh, anchors on, on our station this morning, I did say that it's about time that African countries began to source solutions to African problems. We've heard several uh, notable speakers and African leaders say that, um, and even on our station, we've heard contributors say that the solution to Africa's problems lies in Africa by Africans. Um, I, I was saying that I would hope that African leaders would not come back to the UN General Assembly again this year, cap in hand, seeking for debt relief, seeking for um, debt pardon, seeking for more aid from the Western world and from, from, from foreign countries. Now, he didn't categorically say that uh, we should get more support, more supplies, more aid, but he did say that, um, you know, the developed countries should support in, in, in not, maybe not using the same terms, but he actually did say that they should not overlook the developing countries, that we still, in one way or the other, need support, we still need some hand-holding. But in all of that, I strongly still believe, and I stand by my words, it's about time for Africa to take charge of African issues. And if Africa does want a uh, permanent seat at the Security Council, then we have to be seeking permanent solutions. Still on the 79th United Nations General Assembly convened in New York, world leaders gathered to confront urgent global challenges. Notable speeches from the presidents of the United States, South Africa, Brazil and Turkey underscored the critical need for international collaboration and sustainable solutions. New Central's Chidima Ona reports. At the 79th UN General Assembly, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa addressed the exclusion of Africa from key decision-making structure in the UN Security Council, calling for reform. Ramaphosa also highlighted South Africa's commitment to peace, security and human rights. Achieving and maintaining peace and security requires the collective will of the community of nations gathered here. 78 years since its formation, 
the structure of the United Nations Security Council remains largely unchanged. Africa and its 1.4 billion people remain excluded from its key decision-making structure. This cannot continue. The UN Security Council must be reformed as a matter of agency. In his final address to the UN General Assembly as US President, Joe Biden emphasized the urgent need for humanitarian assistance in war-torn regions. He called for renewed global partnerships, urging nations to collaborate in tackling climate change and addressing global inequality. Our test is to make sure that the forces holding us together are stronger than those who are pulling us apart. That the principles of partnership that we came here each year to uphold can withstand the challenges that the center holds once again. My fellow leaders, I truly believe we're at another inflection point in world history. But the choices we make today will determine our future for decades to come. Will we stand behind the principles that unite us? Will we stand firm against aggression? We, will we end the conflicts that are raging today? Will we take on global challenges like climate change, hunger, and disease? Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Brazil's President Inácio Lula da Silva delivered impassioned speeches on the ongoing humanitarian crisis, stressing the importance of diplomacy in conflict resolution. They called on the international community to collaborate on finding solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. We are living in a time of growing anguish, frustration, tension, and fear. We are witnessing an alarming escalation of geopolitical disputes and strategic rivalries. 2023 holds the sad record of the highest number of conflicts since World War II. Over $90 billion have been mobilized with nuclear arsenals. These resources could have been used to finance the, right, the fight against hunger and climate change. Our problem is with the oppressor and the oppression, just as it was five centuries ago. Everybody should know about this. We will always speak of the truth and speak of what's right and what's fair. The discussions at the UNGA 79 highlighted a growing consensus among world leaders on the interconnectedness of today's challenges and the need for a cooperative action. As the assembly continues, the focus remains on dialogue and the urgent call for a unified response to the global crisis we face. In Lagos for New Central, Chidima Ona. In the meantime, President of Sierra Leone, Julius Madabio, also had his time at the assembly where he pushed for Africa to be given permanent membership in the UN Security Council. Meaningful dialogue and led by example by visiting the head of state of Burkina Faso before Sierra Leone assumed the presidency of the United Nations Security Council in August 2024. We need to build bridges. And this requires the international community's commitment to working with the regions to implement dialogue-based, region-led, and region-owned solutions. We're going to break on the news. When we return, we'll tell you about CBN's MPC meeting. It has increased the NPR, that is the monetary policy rate, to 27.25%. It has rate hike, according to them, not only the solution to inflation. We'll tell you more when we return. Stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us. We now tell you that the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Nigeria has increased the monetary policy rate, which sets the benchmark for interest rates from 26.75% to 27.25%, surpassing analysts' and economists' expectations. CBN Governor Olayemi Kadoso 
announced the 50 basis points hike during a press conference on Tuesday following the committee's 297th meeting in Abuja. New Central's business correspondent, Papetra Fasoni Peter, interviewed analysts to gather their perspectives on the decision. Raise the NPR by 50 basis points to 27.25%. This announcement was a shock to many analysts and economists. Uh, I think you know what the market was expecting was a flat, um, you know, change in the policy rate. But this that has happened is a surprise, uh, you know, to the market. Um, continuing to raise hike rates, um, it's got to stop because whilst you are doing that, first you are not reducing money supply, and secondly, like you said, we are. Um, affecting businesses, cost of borrowing is going to go up regardless of what you do. As soon as you hike rates, cost of borrowing will go up. Though the rate hike may pose challenges for local businesses and production, it can also attract foreign investors seeking higher yields, especially as central banks in the US and UK ease policies. You will find that Nigeria is now a more compelling market for you know, those investments coming from abroad uh, to look for higher yield on investment instruments. And that, to my mind, should support the stability and possibly the appreciation of our exchange rate. When a country understands uh, how to make the best use of foreign portfolio investments, you can sustain those investments over a medium to long term in your economy and they continue to help you to stabilize your currency. Analysts unanimously argue that addressing Nigeria's inflation crisis requires a more structural approach beyond simply cutting interest rates. Where hopefully if we get it right with the Dangote, with the introduction of Dangote into the picture with regards to refined petroleum products, we should see a significant reduction in the demand pressures on the, on, 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 on the dollar. So this is completely outside of the NPR thing and all of that. This is just something that we're talking about the exchange rate. And if we get that right, then we should see a reduction in inflation. Well, I think two numbers come to mind for me uh, when we talk about exchange rates. Uh, number one is $7.3 billion. That is the amount that you know, government officials have said that Nigeria will be able to save when we sell our crude oil in Naira to local refiners. A more compelling number for us to save on an annual basis going forward looks to me like that $20 billion, assuming that you know, we can completely eliminate all form of oil-related importation. I think that would be more instructive and more supportive of our, of our FS rate stability going forward. The 297th meeting of the MPC also saw the committee hike NPR by 50 basis points to 27.25%, retain the asymmetric corridor around the NPR at plus 500 to minus 100, raise the cash reserve ratio of deposit money banks to 50% and that of merchant banks by 200 basis points to 16%. However, it retained the liquidity ratio at 30%. In Lagos, for New Central, I am. Perpetua Fasome Peter. Away from that, President Bola Tinumbu has withheld assents to a bill proposing to extend the service tenure of legislative officers at the National Assembly and the 36 state houses of assembly. The bill sought to increase the tenure from 35 to 40 years and raise the retirement age from 60 to 65 years. The president's decision was conveyed in a letter read by Senate President Godfrey Pabio during the Senate session, this harmonized and controversial retirement age bill had earlier been shelved in February 2024 for further consultation following significant opposition from lawmakers. First introduced in the 7th Assembly, the bill also stalled in the 9th Assembly being, before being reintroduced in the 10th Senate. In the meantime, President Bola Tinumbu has submitted an additional supplementary budget proposal for the Federal Capital Territory Administration for consideration and passage to the House of Representatives. The proposal was read by the Speaker of the House at the resumption of plenary after a two-month annual recess and backed upon by lawmakers. President Tinumbu says that an additional proposal is being prepared 
on the reviewed revenue and expenditure forecasts of the Federal Capital Territory Administration, which aligns with the fiscal and developmental policies of the federal government and will help the FCTA to prioritize and improve human development within the capital. I write in accordance with the provisions of Section 121 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to forward herewith an additional supplementary budget proposal for the FCT for consideration and passage by the House of the Representatives. This supplementary budget proposal has been prepared on the basis of the FCT's re reviewed revenue and expenditure forecast. While I trust that the House of Representatives will, in their usual expeditious manner, consider and approve the 2024 supplementary budget proposal of the FCTA, please accept, Grand Honorable Speaker, the assurances of my highest considerations and regards. You are sincerely Let's also tell you that President Bola Tenumbu has formally requested the Senate's confirmation of Justice Kudirat Kikirekun as the Chief Justice of Nigeria. The letter addressed to the Senate was read by Senate President Gatula Fabio during Tuesday's plenary. In a letter, Tenumbu invoked Section 231, Subsection 1 of the Nigerian Constitution, which grants him the authority to appoint the CJN upon the recommendation of the National Judicial Council, subject to Senate approval. He expressed strong confidence in Justice Kikere Akun's nomination and urged the Senate to expedite the confirmation process. The NJC had in August recommended Justice Kikere Akun to the President as the successor to former CJN Justice Olukayodi Ariwola. to forward for confirmation by the Senate the appointment of 21 on the listed nominees as commissioners to fill the existing vacancies of their respective states in the Revenue Mobilization Allocation and Fiscal Commission. Ms. Linda Nkeshi Oti, for Abia State, Mr. Akpani Mo Efiong for Akwaibom, Enefe Ekene for Anambra, Professor Steve Uba for Benue, Chief Eyonsa Wili Cross River, uh, Oruviere Egawe for Delta, Ndoka Henry Auregu for Eboi, Victor Eboigbe uh, for Edo, uh, Wumi Ogunola for Aikiti, uh, Ozo. Meanwhile, Senator representing Abia North, Oji Uzo Kalu, has called on President Bola Tinubu to take urgent and decisive actions to alleviate the growing economic hardship Nigerians are facing. Speaking to journalists on Tuesday at the National Assembly's resumption in Abuja, Senator Kalu acknowledged the steps already been taken by the President but emphasized that more needs to be done to ease the burden on citizens. Responding to questions about the pressure within the ruling party to reinstate fuel subsidies, the senator expressed his support for any decision that will help reduce the economic strain on Nigerians. The reformation going on now has never happened in the last 60 years. No president, no president, as I'm telling you, had the courage to do what President Tinubu is doing now. It's about courage. The man is very courageous in terms of courage. Possibly if I'm president, what he's doing now to reform the economy, taking everything together, I might not do it. I might come slowly, but the man is very courageous. Very, very courageous. So the, the, it goes with hardship. So people, I know, even in my village, in everywhere I go, the companies, everybody, there's hardship. But I appeal to federal government, I appeal to the president to know how he can bring soccer quickly to the people of Nigeria. He has to do something, not yesterday, today. Not tomorrow, today. He must do something like yesterday because the condition of Nigerian people is not too good. And I, I believe no president will want his people to suffer. No president in the world 
elected by people who want those people to suffer. So I believe him and his team, you know, we are here, we are making laws. You people think we are the one holding government. We are not the one holding government. We are just, there are three arms of government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. We are here making laws. We don't do any other thing that make laws. And it's in that lawmaking that we live. So it is not totally out of place, but Nigeria will come out strong. Still in the Red Chamber, Nigerian Senate has adjourned its plenary in honor of the late Senator Ifanyu Ba, who passed away during the National Assembly's annual recess. The Red Chamber reconvened on Tuesday following the break that began in late Jan July. During this session, Senate President Gosola Fabio read several correspondences from President Bola Tinubu following these formalities. The lawmakers paid tribute to the late Uba by observing a moment of silence in his memory. Senator Ifan Uba, who passed away in late July 2024 at the age of 52, represented the Anambra State Senatorial District and served as the chairman of the Senate Committee on Petroleum Resources downstream. We remain resolute in our commitment to ensuring the development of our great nation. Very unfortunately, in the course of the break, this sad news of a very vibrant, distinguished colleague, a man who exuded so much candor, distinguished senator, if I am back, was broken. A monumental loss to this National Assembly, the Senate in particular, his family, the good people of Anambra State and Nigeria as a whole. We therefore extend our heartfelt condolences to his family, his constituents, Anambra State, and indeed our dear nation. At the appropriate time, will do justice to his legacies by devoting more time in chambers to discuss the times. And I'll tell you that Justice Bin Tanyako of the Federal High Court in Abuja has recused herself from the trial of detained leader of the indigenous people of Biafra over her charges bordering on treasonable felony. This followed the demand by the IPOP leader, Namdi Kano, after he went on a tirade in court, uh, insisting the trial judge should recuse herself from the trial. The U.S. Central's Emmanuel Bagudu reports. It was a clash between the accused, the defense counsel, and the trial judge. The point of contention here is that the proscribed IPOP leader says that he is not convinced that the court presided over by Justice Binta Inyaku has the jurisdiction to try him, having been vindicated by the Supreme Court, which had earlier ruled that he should be tried in London, where he committed the alleged crime. It says all these things are online. Is it not page 18? All these things are online. So I suggest that the journalists in this country actually take out time to do some basic research. It's not difficult, just minor research. You will understand the vacuousness, the emptiness of all the charges against me. They kept, they kept switching the charges. They said I committed this crime in England, isn't it? Justice Iyaku, who couldn't stand the protest scene created by the IPOP leader, announced her withdrawal from the trial. The court did make some order, and the consequences of that order would have re resulted in getting him adequately prepared. But most of those orders were disobeyed yes. in their material particulars. For instance, we were not provided a clean room where no one will have listening devices to listen to our conversations. The IPOP leader continued his agitations without mincing words, exonerating the IPOP group, saying it is not responsible for the fragile peace in the southern eastern part of the country. Those of Biafra are trying to use my name 
to gain relevance. Yes. I don't want it. No I don't want any killings, no kidnapping. All these nonsense are alien to us as a people. Yes. I don't know where these animals came from. Yes. They are taking advantage of the fact that I'm in detention. But it will, it will soon end. Yes. It will soon end. Yes. What, what on IPOB. Yes. Trying to use the room of IPOB. Yes. Trying to subvert the will of the people, our principles and our core values. That person has a lot to contend with yeah. when Very the time well. comes. Yeah. You can run, but you can never hide. You can run and hide and be talking all manner of rubbish. But one day, we will catch up with you. For now, Kanu has been taken back to detention and his case file handed back to the chief judge. In Abuja, for News Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. Still on judicial, judicial matters, uh, Justice James Omotosho of the Federal High Court in Abuja dismissed two separate motions on Tuesday filed by the Edo State Government and the State House of Assembly seeking to overturn the reinstatement of Philip Shaibu as Deputy Governor of the state. The court also awarded a total cost of 400,000 Naira against the Edo State Government and the State Assembly. Justice Omotosho awarded the costs on the State Attorney General and the State Assembly in favor of Shaibu after the counsel for the State Attorney General Marvin Omorogbe and the House of Assembly Sonia Edunia expressed their intention to withdraw the motions for a stay of execution. And now to the Praetorium sector. The President and Chief Executive of Dangote Group, Adiko Dangote, has urged the federal government to end fuel subsidies completely. Speaking in a 26-minute interview with Bloomberg Television in New York, he said the time is right to end subsidies which have gulped trillions of naira from the country's coffers. According to him, the removal would assist in determining the country's actual consumption. His advice follows the recent commencement of petrol lifting from the Dangote refinery and price increments to 950 naira per litre in Lagos State and its environs and above 1,000 naira in the north. He stated that fuel production from its refinery will help ease pressures on the naira and also confirmed ownership of two oil blocks in the upstream sector with an expected production date of next month. Nigeria's Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative says that about 16.25 trillion naira was lost to crude oil theft between 2009 and 2020. This was as they spoke to newsmen in Abuja as part of preparations for the annual general meeting of the Publish What You Pay Nigeria Coalition, which aims to stem corruption in the nation's extractive sector. New, Central, New Central's correspondent, Joshua Marai, has more in this report. Nigeria Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative reports that between 2009 and 2020, the nation lost about 619.7 million barrels of oil, worth 16.25 trillion naira, due to crude oil theft. The initiative further revealed that the nation lost about 4.2 billion liters of petroleum products from refineries, valued at $1.84 billion between 2009 and 2018. This, the initiative blames on corruption saying it impacts negatively on the nation's development. With this in mind, pro-transparency experts have converged on Abuja as part of the Publish What You Pay Alliance to deliberate on improving transparency and accountability in the extractive sector. In ensuring transparency in the extractive sector, there is the need to understand that there is the supply side and there is the demand side. The meeting here is coming to set the agenda for their general meeting to ensure that there is, there is collectivity, there is inclusivity, and that the people can speak with one accord on behalf of 200 million Nigerians. We need to be deliberate about demanding accountability, which is the demand side you know, of transparency, and so that we can keep the government on their toes, ensure that they supply us the kind of information we do. And then we also need to educate citizens, because when you have citizens buy in, it is easier for civil society to push these issues. And then because citizens understand what they need, you now use civil society as a vehicle to get government to address Issues. The urge government to consider reports submitted by NATI and eradicate corruption in the nation's extractive sector. Nigeria needs to step in more, look at all the necessary conventions, look at uh, areas 
uh, where uh, IET make recommendations so that we can be able to improve upon what we are doing, even in the, uh, tr in the accountability of even the little revenue that was generated in the extractive industry. That is in fiscal responsibility. Nigeria needs to do more on that area. The annual general meeting of the coalition will seek to evaluate the progress made by Nigeria's extractive industry. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imanayi. Nigeria's federal government says that it has concluded plans to convert locomotive engines to run on compressed natural gas. This was made known by the Minister of Transportation during an inspection ride to ascertain the readiness and efficiency of the converted locomotives, saying that the federal government hopes to save over 60% of the operation costs of rail transportation from the retrofitting process of locomotive engines. He also adds that the new initiative will potentially decrease the cost of train fares. After retrofitting the locomotives, we are now going to engage the Sadel to bring wagons. We are going to use wagons for freight in all the segments that we operate. That will further bring down the cost of goods and services because the transportation cost has been reduced. We are operating Lagos Ibadan already. We are operating Abuja, Kaduna, Wari, Itape, Potako to Aba. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu GCFR has engaged the president of China, President Xi Jinping, for the financing of all our projects under railway modernization. Nigeria has enough resources of gas. With this retrofitting, as the Honorable Minister says earlier, the cost of transportation will drop to by 70%. Technology is European technology. Our technical partner, the Fuel Fusion, is Poland technical um, company. Then it's 30% international and 70% indigenous. There are indications that the Abia state governments will commence the payment of the new minimum wage in October. Commissioner for Information, O.K. Kanu, made this known during a press briefing on the resolutions of the State Executive Council. This long-awaited news has been welcomed by workers across the state. New Central's Chinwe Ogili has more. On July 25, 2024, the federal government and organized labor reached an agreement on a new minimum wage of 70,000 naira. However, two months after the pronouncement, the implementation of the wage structure remains pending across most states in the country. The announcement by the Commissioner for Information, OK Kano, set in a date for the commencement of payments in Abia has been met with cautious optimism by workers. Bearing the need of foreseen circumstances, Abia State Government will commence uh, the payment of minimum uh, wage to these workers from the month of October. This, in part, is to underscore the government's commitment to the welfare of Abia workers and the fulfillment of uh, the promise of His Excellency. For the civil servants in Abia State, it is all about fulfillment of the promise made by the governor himself on the Workers' Day. I'm pleased to inform you that we shall take the lead in implementation as soon as a new national wage oh. <laughs> is agreed. Once we are through, we will not only implement it, but we will also backdate it and pay you arrears. However, the commissioner was unable to confirm whether the governor will pay arrears, leaving workers uncertain about what to expect by the end of October. For quite a fortnight till date, we as civil servants have not seen anything till this month that he, we had that he said that he's going to pay the 70,000 minimum wage. The lack of clarity has left many in suspense, but workers remain optimistic that the government will not only meet but exceed expectations. To pay the same 70,000 naira from the federal government's approval, and I know he may even add more. He may even add more than that because um, uh, seeing that young man as a governor, he he he, he likes doing something above or doing something different from what others have been. I believe if, if they even give the 70 that they promised, 
it will be a big relief. Anything less than that is, is, is still, is, it amounts to not helping the masses. When contacted for comments, the annual state chairman of the Nigeria Labour Congress, Wunayo Koro, said he was attending a national level meeting in Bauchi on the modalities for the payment of the minimum wage and was unavailable for an interview at the time. Expectedly, everyone who works as a civil servant in Abia State Civil Service will receive what is due to him or her in due course. In Omaha for New Central, Chinwe Ugele. Terror attack aftermath. Mali Junta Chief Goita reviews strategy. We'll tell you more when we. The news continues in West Africa, where Mali's junta chief convened top military officials to reassess security strategies following devastating terrorist attacks in the capital, Bamako, which claimed numerous lives. An Al-Qaeda-linked group took responsibility for last Tuesday's coordinated strikes, targeting a section of the capital's main airport and a military police training facility. The attacks left over 75 people dead and more than 250 injured. During the high-level meeting, officials conducted a thorough review of security protocols, reassessing the evolving threat and issuing fresh directives to bolster defense measures. In his first public address since the attacks, Ma Mali's military leader, Colonel Asimi Goita, honored the victims and emphasized the urgent need for heightened vigilance and exemplary operational readiness in the face of ongoing threats. And I'll bring you business news from our business desk. In business, Nigeria's unemployment rate rose from 5% in the third quarter of 2023 to 5.3% in the first quarter of 2024. The National Bureau of Statistics released its most recent report on Tuesday, and it showed that the unemployment rate in urban regions stayed at 6%, while it fell to 4.3% in rural areas. According to the report, the unemployment rate among males was 4.3% and 6.2% among females. In Q1 2024 and Q3 2023, the unemployment rate in urban areas was 6%. However, in Q1 2024 and Q3 2023, the unemployment rate in urban areas was 6%. The Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission reports that 1,220,245 complaints were filed through its customer complaints units in 2023, with the majority of the complaints being related to electricity users overbilling and metering. According to the report, the complaints bothered on metering, overbilling, disconnection, service disruption, delay in reconnection, load shedding and voltage interruptions, among others. The two discos with the most complaints were Ibado with 207,216 and Port Harcourt with 205,054, accounting for 16.98% and 16.80% of all complaints respectively. Yola discos and Aba discos in contrast had the fewest complaints with 4,029 and 11,930 respectively, accounting for 0.98% and 0.33% of all complaints. And finally, top Zimbabwean retailers have warned of potential store closures if the government insists on the use of an official exchange rate they deem overvalued and damaging their competitiveness. Five months after its launch, Zimbabwe's new gold-backed currency ZIG, which stands for Zimbabwe Gold, is under pressure and has lost almost 80% of its value on the black market, where it trades between 20 and 26 ZIG to $1. Official guidelines require that formal retailers set prices based on the official exchange rate of 14.8 ZIG to $1 or face fines. But retailers including OK Zimbabwe, SPAR and TM Supermarkets, a local unit of South Africa's pick and pay, argue that this overvalued rate is making their products more expensive than those in informal shops, driving away customers. That's offering on business news at this time. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasame Peter. The news continues. And that's all at this hour, but before we go, let's take a look at some of our top stories again.
Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima addresses UN General Assembly calls for action against climate change. Central Bank of Nigeria raises interest rate to 27.25%, fifth in 2024. We also told you that Mali Junta chief Asimi Goita reviews strategy after terror attack. To follow us on social media, we are at News Central TV and you can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Evo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Yikon on Obanjo.